people in Canada are being expected to vote in the next 12 to 13 months, in all likelihood, on these people. Does it not make sense for democracy, for the integrity of the system, and for foreign interference to be stymied at its root to expose this and shine the light on it? Does that not make a ton of sense? As an individual, uh, we're pleased to welcome Mr. Benjamin Fung, who is a professor and Canada Research Chair at McGill University. And from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, John Bateman has joined us by video conference. He's a senior fellow and co-director of technology and international affairs. I'm going to start with you, uh, Mr. Bateman, online. Uh, if you want to uh, address the committee for up to five minutes, you're welcome to do so. Go ahead, sir. Uh, you're... Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair and committee members. It's an honor to appear at this important hearing. My name is John Bateman. I'm a senior fellow and co-director of the Technology and International Affairs Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Carnegie is an independent nonprofit think tank with headquarters in Washington, D.C., and global centers in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. In recent years, democracies worldwide have grown increasingly concerned about threats to the integrity of their information environments, including misinformation, disinformation, and foreign influence. My Carnegie colleagues and I have drawn on empirical evidence to clarify the nature and extent of these threats and to assess the promise and pitfalls of potential countermeasures. Today, I will share some overarching lessons from this research. To be clear, I'm not an expert on the Canadian situation specifically, so I may not be able to give detailed answers about particular incidents or unique dynamics in your country. Instead, I will highlight key themes applicable across democracies. Let me start with some important foundations. As you have already heard, misinformation can refer to any false claim, whereas disinformation implies an intentional effort to deceive. Foreign influence can be harder to define because it requires legal or normative judgments about the boundaries of acceptable foreign participation in domestic discourse, which is sometimes unclear. Foreign actors often use mis- and disinformation, but they also use other tools like co-optation, coercion, overt propaganda, and even violence. These activities can pose serious threats to a country's information integrity. Still, it is domestic actors, ordinary citizens, politicians, activists, corporations, who are the major sources of mis- and disinformation in most democracies. This should not be surprising. Domestic actors are generally more numerous, well-resourced, politically sophisticated, deeply embedded within society, and invested in domestic political outcomes. Defining and differentiating these threats is hard enough. Applying and acting on the definitions is much harder. Calling something mis- or disinformation requires invoking some authoritative source of truth. Yet, people in democracies can and should disagree about what is true. Such disagreements are inevitable and essential for driving scientific progress and social change. Overzealous efforts to police the information environment can transgress democratic norms or deepen societal distrust. However, not all factual disputes are legitimate or productive. We must acknowledge that certain falsehoods are undermining democratic stability and governance around the world. A paradigmatic example is the claim that the 2020 U.S. presidential election was stolen. This is provably false, it was put forward with demonstrated bad faith, and it has deeply destabilized the country. Mis- and disinformation are highly imperfect concepts, but they do capture something very real and dangerous that demands concerted action. So, what should be done? In our recent report, Dean Jackson and I surveyed a wide range of countermeasures, from fact-checking to foreign sanctions to adjustments of social media algorithms. Drawing on hundreds of scientific studies and other real-world data, we asked three fundamental questions. How much is known about each measure? How effective does it seem given what we know? And how scalable is it? Unfortunately, we found no silver bullet. None of the interventions were well-studied, very effective, and easy to scale all at the same time. Some may find this unsurprising. 
After all, disinformation is an ancient, chronic phenomenon driven by stubborn forces of supply and demand. On the supply side, social structures combine with modern technology to create powerful political and commercial incentives to deceive. On the demand side, false narratives can satisfy real psychological needs. These forces are far from unstoppable, yet policymakers have limited resources, knowledge, political will, legal authority, and civic trust. Thankfully, our research does suggest that many popular countermeasures are both credible and useful. The key is what we call a portfolio approach. This means pursuing a diversified mixture of multiple policies with varying levels of risk and reward. A healthy portfolio would include tactical actions, like fact-checking and labeling social media content that seem fairly well-researched and effective. It would also involve costlier, longer-term bets on promising structural reforms, such as financial support for local journalism and media literacy. Let me close by observing that most democracies do not yet have a balanced portfolio. They are underinvesting in the most ambitious reforms with higher costs and longer lead times. If societies can somehow manage to meet the big challenges, like reviving local journalism and bolstering media literacy for the digital age, the payoff could be enormous. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Bateman. Uh, really appreciate the insight in your opening statement. Mr. Fung, uh, you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Please start. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. I'm a professor and Canada Research Chair at McGill University, and I'm a computer scientist. My research interests include AI, cybersecurity, and disinformation analysis. I'm particularly interested in analyzing disinformation spreading in the Chinese-Canadian communities. I'm not going to repeat the disin disinformation examples, as I believe uh, you have already heard many of those examples from different channels in the last uh, few years. Instead, I would like to focus on recommendations that may help fighting disinformation from the Chinese government. Let's take a closer look into what other countries have been doing to fight disinformation. The U.S. government has set up an agency called Global Engagement Center, which is responsible to counter foreign state and non-state propaganda and disinformation efforts, aimed at influencing the policies and security of the United States. The Global Engagement Center has the authority to preempt the disinformation uh, from social media. Furthermore, they have a te technology engagement division which play an important role to transform technologies from application to from concepts to application at scale and pushes innovations to both public and private sectors. Another country that is at the front line of fighting disinformation from the Chinese government is Taiwan. My collaborator Zi Feng Li has done an excellent study. Here, I, I will highlight a few key points from her research. Unlike the U.S. model, Taiwan takes a decentralized approach. They have multiple fact-checking centers that are run by the civil societies. This setup successfully gains the trust from the general public because the citizens understand that these fact-checking centers are not controlled by the government and they know they can participate participate in the process too. Most importantly, they have an effective social network to spread the correct information back to the society. Taiwan has a few think tanks that analyze the origins, tactics, and implications of disinformation. They regularly organize conferences to bring disinformation experts together to facilitate collaboration. There's no conflict between the U.S. model and the Taiwan model, in Canada, we can do both. My third recommendation is to look into the social media platform. Social media platforms like WeChat and TikTok play a crucial role in spreading disinformation despite heavy Chinese government censorship. WeChat, the most popular app, circulates Chinese government approved propaganda, which, uh, while uh, accurate Canadian information, struggles to reach users. Any solutions without the cooperation of the social media platform is meaningless. Intervention should include banning bots' accounts, 
restricting posts or adding warning messages. Platforms that do not comply with this new regulation should be subject to evaluations and penalties. Finally, I would like to uh, share my latest observation. There are two types of social media bots, human bots and AI bots. Human bots are easier to detect as they use specific vocabularies or sometimes they just follow China time songs. Their posts typically spread within two to layers of sharing, mostly stay staying within the Chinese Canadian community. However, the emerging trend is the AI bots. AI bots can spread this information beyond five layers of sharing, even reaching local communities. Therefore, I would like to emphasize that this disinformation issue is not limited to the Chinese Canadian community. With the advancement of AI technologies, all Canadians are affected. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Fung. We're going to start with our questioning now. Each uh, member is going to have six minutes for questioning. Um, and just for our witnesses, very limited amount of time to ask these questions. Oftentimes, members will reclaim their time uh, to try to ask as many questions as they can within those six minutes. So please don't take it personally if you get cut off. Um, but uh, we're going to try to uh, get through this uh, as, as best we can here. And I'm going to start with Mr. Caputo for six minutes. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Caputo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bateman. Thank you, Professor Fung, for being here. Um, now, Mr. Bateman, you had uh, intimated at the outset of your remarks that you may not be um, as overly familiar with the uh, situation here, uh, but I want to uh, just elaborate on a few of your principles that you spoke about. Now, you spoke about supply and demand when it comes to foreign interference or disinformation, um, and also the fact that it is politicians who are most often the sources of misinformation, disinformation. Uh, would you agree as well that politicians actually not only um, are critical when it comes to what they put out, but also in their function when um, they are in a, a security capacity and a capacity of uh, ensuring that disinformation doesn't get out. In other words, politicians, government plays a protective role. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I would. And part of that protective role is that when government sees things going awry, things going sideways, and they see misinformation and disinformation occurring, that government actually has an obligation to act. I, I take it you'd agree with that as well? Well, it depends on the nature of the action being contemplated, because some actions can be helpful and others can be counterproductive. Okay. So w what I'm saying is that <clears throat> when misinformation and disinformation are occurring, uh, the government can conceivably do nothing but to do nothing is to allow this to occur even more. Is that, isn't that right? Uh, to some extent, but typically a lot of information is transmitted through society without the government taking any particular action. Um, in the case of foreign influence activities, there's a lot more the government can do. But whether or not to uh, publicly disclose such activity or take technical measures or diplomatic measures against the country at issue is often a complicated calculation. Well, it, it certainly is a complicated calculation, but I think you'd agree that shining the light on foreign interference in some way is always the best <coughs> antidote to address foreign interference, is it not? It often is. The exception to that principle is that Sometimes the foreign actor may anticipate and even desire or benefit from the public disclosure of their operation. Um, for example, if uh, Russia is conducting a, an influence operation that is publicly exposed, and then that public exposure actually creates a lot more societal anxiety and fear and distrust than the initial influence operation itself, that could be considered a win for Russia. So that's one of the complications saying. that government I, needs to consider. I see what you're saying. They're sowing chaos and they're getting their desired results. Now, when it comes to elected officials, uh, generally, I think it's in everybody's best interest to know whether they're elected officials, the people that they're putting an X beside when it comes to elections, have been willingly or semi-willingly participating in foreign interference. You'd agree with that? Yes. So 
in such cases, transparency is paramount. Um, if the government is aware that elected officials are are um, participating in foreign interference willingly, the best thing that can be done uh, is to address those things publicly, is it not? That would require a framework of law and, again, careful consideration. Uh, for example, I'm a former U.S. intelligence analyst, and so I'm familiar with the possibility that there could be unverified intelligence information about as someone being co-opted or roped into I, foreign yes, disinformation, but that I, might not be a legal certainty. Right. So, sorry, and I don't mean to cut you off, but uh, but I'm just going to ask you to operate on the assumption that uh, we have intelligence services in Canada that have verified and they have come to conclusions. And the conclusions are that 11 parliamentarians have, or either wittingly or semi-wittingly, um, uh, acting um, with... Uh, foreign and hostile states. This intelligence has been verified. It went into a report. In that case there, people in Canada are being expected to vote in the next 12 to 13 months, in all likelihood, on these people. Does it not make sense for democracy, for the integrity of the system, and for foreign interference to be stymied at its root to expose this and shine the light on it. Does that not make a ton of sense? Without commenting on the Canadian situation, because I don't know the details, I would just say there are situations where an intelligence assessment might fall short of a prosecutable offense, and that would then create a judgment call and a difficult uh, decision. Uh, but I, I'm not familiar with the Canadian specifics. Well, could there be any worse discord? You know, you talked about the Russia example. Is there anything worse... Um, any worse discord than people questioning whether who they're voting for is compromised by a hostile state? I do think one of the reasons that public disclosure can be helpful is when the lack of disclosure creates an environment in which selective leaks and rumors are running rampant. Uh, we saw this in previous U.S. elections, and that did seem to lead to a policy of greater disclosure, but not universal disclosure. Each disclosure needs to be taken on its own terms. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Bateman.